nonprofit, nonprofit organization um, who serves kids and families across the state of Kentucky. And our mission is to make Kentucky the best place in America to be young. Um, we are home to a couple of initiatives, and one of those is the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky. And we have Norman Hatfield on here, who is the president of the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky, who you will hear from later. Um, but today we are focused on early childhood education and the importance of early childhood education and accessing programs that provide opportunities for that, including Head Start and Early Head Start. Um, we have here today with us Donna Taylor, who is with the um, Ohio Valley Educational Cooperative, and they oversee several Head Start and Early Head Start programs in um, Jefferson uh, and then many surrounding, I think 15 surrounding counties um, around, uh, around this area of the state. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Donna and she can explain way more about what she does at OVEC and then talk a bit about um, early childhood education. If you do have questions, please go ahead and drop those in the chat. And then I think um, our, our panelists would also be open to taking questions um, uh, verbally as well um, when, when they are ready to, and they'll indicate when that, uh, when that is the case. So Donna, go ahead and uh, take it away. Awesome, well, um, thank you for having me. Um, I'll just give um, a basic overview of Head Start and Early Head Start, um, some of the services that are offered through Head Start programs, um, specifically what um, supports we provide to families. Um, so stop me at any time with questions or um, I tend to speak quickly. So if you want me to repeat something, just let me know. Um, so Head Start is a federally funded program. Um, it is funded through the um, Office um, of Children and Families. And um, we serve children in early Head Start. We serve children from six weeks to 36 months, which is or 35 months. And then when they turn 36 months, which is three years old, um, then they move to Head Start. And um, Head Start is for three and four year old children. Um, Head Start um, was established to give children from um, economically disadvantaged families um, a Head Start before entering kindergarten so they could enter on an equal playing field. Um, we service um, a full day programs for children. There are also um, several options in different Head Start programs where they offer half day. Um, or like a school day, um, but our program serves um, the entire day for working families. Um, so children are offered um, meals, they're offered a snack when they're in our care, um, lunch and um, an afternoon snack as well, uh, periods of rest and periods of active play. Um, Head Start programs are governed by um, the federal government, as I've mentioned before. So we do follow Head Start performance standards, which um, basically tell our program things that we need to collect data, that we need to collect families, that we need to enroll um, and kind of serve as like a guideline for us to follow. On top of that, we also have to follow uh, state licensing guidelines. So we are licensed programs, childcare programs. Um, and our main goal is to reach quality. So specifically, um, some of the things we offer are early learning and development for children. Um, we work on things like uh, physical development, social emotional development is extremely important, um, uh, fine motor development, uh, literacy skills, early math skills, um, the, the whole range of development for children. Um, we also uh, service health needs and physical needs for children. We do vision and hearing screenings. Um, we also screen for developmental disabilities and help children and families seek uh, developmental services, disability services for children. Um, with that, we have partnerships with local districts and local agencies such as First Steps to help our children get services for speech, occupational therapy, um, and things like that. Um, and we are also serve not just the child, but the whole family. So um, we um, are very interested in family well-being. We help families um, seek financial support. We help families um, get housing, um, apply for jobs. Um, we teach parenting curriculum. Um, so health needs, mental health needs. So we really don't just focus on the children in our care. We also focus on their families and their extended families. 
a lot of our children are um, being raised by grandparents or they're in um, foster care or adoptive care. So, um, yeah, we, it's, there, there's a lot of different opportunities for our children and um, it's been uh, very successful and um, the child outcomes that we've seen um, are just astronomical. I mean, when, when children start with us at birth and then we have them until five and they go to kindergarten school ready is, is our biggest goal. So when they enter school, um, you know, they are, um, have the tools they need to be uh, socially and emotionally ready to sit through a kindergarten class and interact with their peers and, um, you know, ha have those um, typically developing skills that other children um, have. Um, let me see, uh, what did I miss here? Eligibility for our children. Um, we have a, a, an extensive application process for Head Start children. Uh, most programs just do it online or you can apply in person. Um, and so we, um, it is based on income. So there are income thresholds for single parent families or double parent families. And then there is a, a point system that we offer for children depending on if they, um, are foster children or adoptive children, or if they have a diagnosed disability, um, homelessness. Um, so there are different factors. Um, and we have an eligibility and recruitment team in Head Start that um, looks at all the applications and screen them to, to decide for eligibility. So um, let me see, what else am I missing? Um, we also focus heavily on uh, mental health and well being. Um, I previously touched on that a little bit ago, but especially with some of the impacts that we're seeing with uh, the pandemic as we're coming out of it and our children are returning in person, we're seeing the effects of that, not only with our children, but with our families too. Um, some trauma that has played out. And so we really focus on trauma-informed care. We help families seek mental health counseling and support. Um, we most programs in OVEC too employs uh, mental health or behavior consultants. Uh, that work one-on-one -on -one with families and work one-on-one -on -one with children um, uh, for those supports. So it looks like there may be a question. Um, if family is struggling with transportation or scheduling, are there opportunities to address those through other programs? Yes. Um, so uh, the, it depends on, Head Start offers several different program options. Um, if you are a center-based program, which means you um, run um, on the districts, the school districts calendars, your school day, transportation is provided through busing. Um, the school bus picks up and drops off children. Um, other program options such as Early Head Start are full day programs. So generally their hours are like from as early as seven in the morning to as late as 6 p.m. Those are parent drop off and pick up. Um, but uh, uh, we have a family service team um, and our family service team consists of family advocates that work directly with uh, families to help them uh, break down barriers such as transportation needs. Um, and um, we do partner with several programs, depending on what county that we're in, to offer some supports for families as well. Um, I'll give you an example with Jefferson County. Um, you know, we, our partners are, are very wide, um, but uh, we do have a partnership with TARC as well to help families um, get TARC um, cards to, you know, bring their children and drop them off when they do, if they do not have transportation or other things like that. Um, same with meals. Um, we work with uh, different organizations to help families um, get meals, um, such as Catholic Charities. Uh, several programs have food banks, um, and we get parents in touch with those for resources. We also work with um, other programs to get clothing and housing needs for families um, and children as well. So I think I pretty much summed up. Let's see, how do you see the program working this upcoming year around the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, uh, the Office of Head Start, who governs Head Start programs, um, has released guidance for programs and really encourages them to return to in-person services because um, Statistically, children, um, um, in some cases, the care that they receive when they're in a Head Start program during the day, receiving um, you know, those educational services and there's no lapse in their educational or their meals or their you know, sleeping and things like that, 
um, it is more beneficial in the long run. And um, that way parents can, and families can get back to work. So our program specifically has returned to 100% in person. Um, uh, we do have um, large initiatives to make sure that our staff get fully vaccinated. We um, really work with families to help them find opportunities to get fully vaccinated. Um, there are, um, like I said, we are um, a licensed program in the state of Kentucky. And so um, uh, daycare licensing regulations have really changed a lot through the pandemic and requiring further hand washing and sanitizing and um, you know, other steps like that have been addressed so that families feel comfortable bringing their children to our care and we keep children as safe as possible um, and while still, you know, following those different regulations. <clears throat> Let's see, there was a question. Can you explain how a kinship family who needs additional resources would ask for help through the program? Do they talk with a teacher or is there someone else? That is a wonderful question. Um, really any single person that works for a Head Start program should be able to communicate to a parent how to get a specific resource. So it wouldn't really be one designated person they could ask. It depends on who they feel most comfortable with. A lot of times when there is parent drop off and pick up, the parents have a very good relationship with the teacher because they see them every single day. With busing, the parents may not see the teachers as much. So we have a family service team and our family advocates are um, really their number one contact. And they are um, out in our communities. They know the, the different partnerships that we have and the different programs that are offered in every region and every area. And so they really work closely with the families um, to get them uh, resources, especially those um, in kin with kinship care. So. I hope that answered that. Let's see, does the program know ahead of the child's enrollment such as kinship or foster? Oftentimes, um, yes. Um, sometimes we families are referred to Head Start through different um, organizations. It depends on which organization they are um, working with. Um, and we will have that uh, referral sent to us and we can facilitate the application process with the family. Uh, we do have questions on our application where a, uh, somebody uh, could indicate that they are uh, kinship as well. So then that would um, you know, alert the system and that would become part of their eligibility point to be accepted into the program. Donna, I've had some caregivers that um, their child would turn, their grandchild would turn three during the middle of the school year, mm -hmm. and they would um, try to go through the application process and the testing for Head Start, but they would say, oh no, the child has been denied, they're on target, they don't need the services. Um, is there like an appeals process that they could have gone through? Um, not that I am familiar with. A lot of times when early Head Start and Head Start are technically separate programs. So if a child ages out of early Head Start, they have to reapply to be accepted into Head Start. Oftentimes when things have changed, such as a financial situation or a family situation, that can affect a child's acceptance. Uh, and it really is only determined by the individual Head Start program up to their discretion. But um, I guess in order to appeal it, the next step would probably be to go directly to the Office of Head Start because they are who governs Head Start programs. But in, you know, in my experience with it, most children, if they are still in kinship care from the time that they, after they turn three, then they would still be accepted. They would never, um, only circumstances like if a child is officially adopted during that time, then when they reapply, if other circumstances have changed and they are fully adopted now, then they might, might not get accepted. It just, it really depends case by case. I know that wasn't exactly a, a black and white answer, but. Nothing really is black and white. No. <laughs> uh, Donna, I had a question. Do you see from district to district uh, especially when you're thinking about the enrollment of kids and who may qualify or not, do you see enrollment levels being so high that um, it's a that children get turned away, or I mean, does it vary? And uh, and and roughly, I mean, across the state of Kentucky, what does those numbers look like? I don't know if you can answer all of that. But. Yeah. 
So in order to even have a Head Start program in a community, you have to have a community assessment, which tells you the ages of the children in that community, the family structures in those community, the jobs available. And that's how you determine your program structure. What kind of families do we need to serve? Because um, we also, we serve in Jefferson County, as I've mentioned, but we also serve in Trimble County. And those are completely different um, um, you know, children and family dynamics and, and population and the way that people live and raise children. And so all of those factors um, aside, um, it kind of depends on the year as well. So pre-pandemic, um, uh, all Head Start programs, you have to be at least 95% enrolled. Okay, so the goal is full enrollment. If you are under enrolled, then you have to report to the Office of Head Start and explain why you are under enrolled. Maybe um, there was a new factory built in another community nearby. So a lot of your families have moved. So you might have to do a new community assessment. So we, we do find in different districts that enrollment is easier to attain than others. In larger districts, Bullitt County, Jefferson County, it is much easier. Um, in smaller rural communities, it is um, a lot more difficult to get that enrollment. Sometimes it's just word of mouth, um, you know, to get families to even know that these program options exist, especially for children to three years old, because every community has preschool, but, you know, the daycare options, there are now, there is the term be out there being used as, uh, I think it's daycare wastelands or, or something like that, where there's, or childcare deserts, where there's really no childcare available. And so Head Start may be the only option in that. Um, we are finding now that we have opened up um, post-pandemic and even during the pandemic when we were opening not to full capacity, that enrollment is very difficult right now. We are very low enrolled. Um, the Office of Head Start is encouraging programs to continue their efforts in recruiting family and children um, because, you know, without children and staff, you don't really have a program. And so we know there are families out there and we know there are, um, you know, children out there that need our program and, um, and our services that we provide and would benefit from them. And so um, it, that has really become a struggle lately is, is the enrollment. It does differ a lot by district as well. Well, because I didn't see a question, I, I just wanted to make a comment. So my, you know, I've been raising my grandkids um, as a kinship caregiver for seven years now um, and uh, still got quite a ways to go. But uh, my youngest, she actually went into the Head Start program and I saw her before this and then I saw her after this. And I just have to say, one, I didn't know a whole lot about the program in the beginning. And I think that's one of the reasons we really, really appreciate you coming and talking about this because we want to get the word out to as many families across the state of Kentucky as possible. But, but what I saw with my granddaughter is that um, interacting with other kids um, made a huge difference. It did prepare her for kindergarten. She knew better um, kind of... And it's, this is probably not the best words for it, but she kind of understood a little bit better behaviors and interacting when you're kind of in a classroom setting. She loved it. She, um, she couldn't wait to go every day. I found, you know, she was learning more um, things, ABCs, all the different things. She just, it, it just, overall, I felt like it just opened her mind up a little more and kind of set the very simple behaviors um, to, to be in school. And I felt like that gave her a huge advantage uh, in, in preparation for things like that. I mean, she just, it just seemed more positive and it gave her, you know, even, you think about a three-year-old, a four-year-old, but she looked forward to going. Mm -hmm. um, and I just can't say enough about the program with what I saw with her. Um, and, and I just feel like that did give her a huge advantage. And I hope that folks um, you know, ask more questions, you know, specifically in your districts and really, really consider this. I know transportation some, for some, some places can be a problem, but if you can make it work, I just feel like that is a huge investment in our kids. And I just wanted to say that and to thank you so much because it really did make a difference in it for her. Thank you. 
You know, and I always appreciate comments like that. Um, I mean, the work that we do is is amazing to see the growth in children from when they start with us and then when they move on to kindergarten. And especially um, a lot of our classrooms are located inside of our district's school building. So we are even able to see those kids as they get older. Um, and the growth of our families as well. Um, they really become like our second family. Um, we do focus very, very heavily on um, behavior supports and social emotional learning and developing those skills. Um, our uh, curriculum, uh, Head Start programs are required to um, adopt a research-based curriculum into their program that they use for, uh, in order to meet student outcomes. Um, for learning, but in addition to that, most programs also have a social emotional learning curriculum. Um, there are several out there, but the one that um, our program specifically uses is called Conscious Discipline, and it helps tremendously teach children self-regulation skills and empathy and the language to express the way that they feel uh, when those feelings are too big. And that is even translated into uh, middle school and high school. I mean, there, this curriculum is used, you know, with adults. There are, there's a curriculum for educators. I mean, it, it's just simple, like breathing techniques and things like that. And, and so one of the biggest advantages of my job is, is going into a classroom and seeing a child who's uh, clearly struggling to self-regulate their emotions and to understand why why am I angry or why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling? And then I'm struggling. Why is this child, you know, behaving in this way that challenges me? Um, and then really getting to the root of that, tracking it and helping, you know, children learn that it's okay, you know, to have these feelings, but here's how we channel them. And um, in turn, it really helps them learn, you know, how to be a productive student when they can regulate themselves in a classroom then you know, they are ready to learn and um, you know, be a peer and interact positively with their teachers. And so um, I appreciate that comment so much. Um, it is very rewarding. And we also wanna get the word out to as many families across the state as possible. Um, there was a question here. Um, what can caregivers expect as far as benefits when they enroll their child? Behavior changes, helps, ideas on discipline. Yes, like I said, we also um, have a parenting curriculum that we offer families. We do family engagement nights and offer workshops to families. Um, uh, you know, if, if they're really struggling with behaviors at home, a lot of times children act differently in school than they do for, you know, their caregiver. Um, uh, it just depends on the child, really. And so um, we talk about, um, you know, all these different things and all these resources to families, um, specifically in our program. And I know a lot of programs across the state have also adopted this as well. I mentioned our behavior and mental health consultants. They um, come in the classrooms and do classroom mental health observations to where they can um, sort of um, target children and see you know, is this a trigger for this child? Is that, you know, it, it, I'm seeing this behavior during this time of day, and then they can develop a behavior support plan. And that's when they bring in the family and they say, here are some things you can try at home. Here are some things we're doing. And so the benefits in that aspect that families can expect to see, um, you know, you really learn more at, as a, of how to deal with the behaviors at home, not just that they are getting, you know, they're learning that at school as well. Um, the social emotional learning is 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 really the biggest part. Um, and, and in this question, I, I, I did touch on a little bit, it says, does that social emotional learning help the caregiver too? And, and my answer would be yes, because it is very difficult to be, um, to raise children, no matter, you know, if you're the biological parent, if you're a grandparent, if you are a foster parent, if you're an adoptive parent, um, it, it, children are, are difficult and um, as many resources and as, as much as we can learn and you know, help our children, um, it's just, it's wonderful. So um, I hope that answered those questions. Yeah, and, and Donna, you had talked about how um, your curricula um, also includes a trauma-informed approach and knowing that um, children who are in 
um, in homes with relatives or close family friends, like fictive kin, that mm -hmm. separation from their parent is often a trauma. Um, and, and often there's other, you know, things that have happened in the home that could potentially be traumatic to those children. So it sounds like it's, um, it's really critical and, um, and probably a huge benefit to those young people to come into an environment that, that is approaching them in a, in a trauma informed way. And I think um, you touched on this a bit with that social emotional learning, having young people with the ability to recognize their emotions and, and, and put a name to those emotions and then how to channel those emotions into different um, productive means, um, it, it seems uh, like it would be a huge benefit to those relative caregivers. Um, is that something that you also see in, you see it in early Head Start and Head Start, and then is that often carried out into the school districts as well? Or what does that look like? Yes, and every district, uh, you know, does it differently, but I think there has been, especially with the pandemic, a huge shift in the way that people think about trauma and trauma-informed care and trauma-informed approaches to education, um, and so um, I think that districts have adopted different policies and training to, um, you know, to see that through from kindergarten all the way to high school, um, and um, a big shift that we have made is making sure that not only our children are receiving, um, you know, that social emotional learning, but our staff are as well. Um, our teacher assistants, our teachers, our family services staff, um, that they are also, um, everybody is trained on administering trauma-informed approaches and trauma-informed care, but also on how to, um, you know, deal with personal trauma and their own trauma and, um, um, you know, not filling from an empty cup, so to speak. So uh, that 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 shift in thinking across uh, Head Start programs has really been beneficial. So Donna, I, I, you know, you mentioned earlier about, I mean, because we're talking about trauma with the kids and, and and learning behaviors and things like that and, and counseling. And um, so I know you, you, you mentioned that that in the program itself, you're trying to help with some of the trauma-based learning and stuff. How do you connect the dots if the child is already in counseling somewhere else? Do you, through the caregiver, coordinate some conversations between the two to kind of bring more, I don't want to say more consistency, but to maybe leverage some synergy between the two, um, the two places? I mean, how does that work? Yes, we do. So um, our mental health and behavior consultants, or if the child has a, a diagnosed disability, then it would be our disability consultants, will reach out um, to the caregiver um, and get permission to contact the, uh, the, I guess, the organization who's providing services for the children or the whole family and get that information so that we can inform our practice based on what has already been put in place what techniques may have already been used. And so we do work with, we get that facilitated with the caregiver, but then we work with the organization. So we have partnerships with many of these organizations and already know the people that are working there. A lot of, we refer a lot of our families to them. And so we already have that established that great working relationship so that what, and, and a lot of times um, they will come into the classroom and work with the child in the classroom. So if in a comfortable setting, if they, in addition to maybe working with the child in the home or working with the child in the office, it really just depends on what the family is comfortable with. And, um, but we do try and streamline that process the best that we can so that, you know, uh, nothing is uh, uh, unnecessarily duplicated or um, everything is, you know, very intentional. So how do you, if I'm interested, and, mm -hmm. but I don't know a lot about it, and I'll tell you, I didn't, um, do we go to our county school's site? Is there, I think OVEC has a separate site. Where are the different places that we can kind of do some research and, and, and mm -hmm. see what's available for our district, our county? 
Um, so it, depending on the county that you live in, the best way to do it would just be to Google Head Start and, and, and the county that you live in. Um, because nine times out of 10, the, the, the grantee or the organization who holds the Head Start grant will, their website will come up. So OVEC, we have our, our own website that families can be directed to and, and all of our information is on there, the application is on there. But uh, Head Start, early Head Start programs don't necessarily have to partner with the districts because they're not providing transportation or meals, but Head Start programs do. So the three to five-year-olds, the district, if they have a Head Start in that county, will also probably be able to provide that information to families. But I mean, a simple Google, Google search sometimes, I mean, we're spread out all across the state of the Kentucky. And so uh, we had moved sites and I needed a phone number to one of our sites. So I literally Googled Head Start Bullitt County and their site and phone number and address came up right in my Google search. So um, I know that um, a lot of times um, programs will uh, work really heavily on recruitment efforts. And so you might see a flyer at a doctor's office or a dentist office or um, a McDonald's even um, community events that they, they try to get out there. And so that's why we really try to have strong partnerships with community organizations to get the word to families, because sometimes it's not as easy to locate where that Head Start is, um, you know, their eligibility or if they're even accepting or, or where they're at. So, so I, I think you touched on this a little bit, but sometimes what happens um, what we have to deal with as a kinship caregiver is a child may already be with um, one family, you know, their biological parents or a foster kid. And they may be in one place in one county, and then they have to move. Let's say they're placed with their grandmother or something in another county. Is it easy to transfer, or do you basically have to go through the whole process again based on that caregiver and their situation? Um, it it, it depends. It's a case by case basis. We have had that happen several times where families move to a different state even and they say, we know that the child will still qualify for Head Start and still needs to be in Head Start program. So the family advocate or the family services team would reach out directly to that program and say, hey, I have this child. They're enrolled in our program. Here is, you know, it would with parent permission or with caregiver permission. Here is their information, you know, and can you give us some information that we can then give to the caregiver so they can apply? You would have to reapply um, because every program operates a little bit differently. Like I said, there are those different program options. Um, and so it wouldn't just be um, a transfer, but most likely the Head Start program that's serving the child would help to facilitate that transfer. So that, that's helpful because I think sometimes um, that gets lost when there's a move and the fact that, you know, if, if I'm telling one particular program while they're moving, at least then you can have that conversation about how do I continue the child in the program and, you know, and kind of do that cross communication and coordination to get, get them. Now, do you all then share records from program to program or is it kind of starting all over again? We in can, that regard, kind of like school records. Yes, we can share those records with uh, caregiver permission, parent permission, legal guardian permission, I guess would be the right term. And same with the districts. When children um, leave our program and, and go to the district, the records that we have, all of the, the learning outcomes and the progress is then given to the district. So, or same with disability services so that that care can continue on. And the families are always number one at in the forefront when any decision about children in a Head Start program is made. Uh, it always goes back to the legal guardian's decision. Um, they are viewed as the child's first teacher. Um, the teacher in the Head Start program is the second and the classroom is the third teacher. And so um, any decision regarding a child is always, always communicated. The parents, our, our job as Head Start is to advocate for families and to help them know their options and their resources out there. Um, so for example, um, we, we have to advise parents on their, on their rights 
for disability services. Because if a child is in a Head Start program and is, is um, referred to uh, the district preschool for disability services, the child may have to transfer from Head Start to preschool. It, that is the parent's decision. Uh, we make recommendations and we work with the family to get them everything they need, but ultimately we want to make sure that the families know their rights and understand all of their options. So we are the family's advocate and the child's advocate as well. Well, before I take up a lot more time with comments and questions, does anybody else have questions or comments about the program? that's on here. I know this is going to be recorded and shared multiple times, so we may get more feedback later, but anybody want to comment on anything that's on here? I thought the information was really helpful overall. Um, and I think we would love to continue sharing um, and, and making people aware of the program. I think a lot of relative and fictive can caregivers don't necessarily know that um, that this is something that they can enroll in and take part in. So I think it's it's really beneficial to at least hear that. And then Sheila also made a comment in the chat. Yeah, I, and you know, I, I, I just wanna say that um, the coalition has been trying to look and identify as many resources as possible, you know, support groups. And, you know, I think that um, we need to make sure that support groups are out there. We're gonna share this with them. Um, but I think that when you when you look at a population um, of kinship caregivers, there just feels like there's not enough resources. So I, I want to make sure that we highlight this. We really appreciate your time, Donna, um, and for all the the folks in the programs around the state. I personally, and I know I, I, I've said this before, um, but I've seen it with my granddaughter myself. I saw what she was like before, and I saw how much more she was um, opened up. You know, I mean, it's education. It's it's learning so many different things when you're at that age, young age, um, as far as socialization and expectations. And um, this is an amazing resource for caregivers because, you know, we're dealing with kids with that are traumatized at some level being in foster families as well. We're dealing with kids that have been removed from their home. That's trauma. Um, that's confusion. That's, that's, that's a lot that a child and a caregiver is dealing with. And the fact that this program is out there working with so many others in the community, trying to bridge the gap to focus on the child and the caregiver and, and give all the resources is huge. And I wanna make sure that everybody knows what you do uh, what these programs do, because um, it, it is an available resource that we've got to get the word out on if we want to help our kids thrive. And I just thank you so much for your time. I want to thank everybody that's on here. If um, We're going to post a survey that just asks about caregivers and the program and what they may think of it, what they may, um, what their needs are. If you've been in the program, had your kids in, in the program in the past and you just wanna share some thoughts there, um, we're gonna pass this along to the folks um, just so that they can kind of see the bigger picture. But I just, thank you so much. I wanna thank everybody for participating and um, stay tuned. We're gonna be doing, trying to do something every month for kinship families and um, you know, kind of get the word out wherever we can. So uh, again, thank you. Uh, Shannon, do you have anything else? Um, nope, just continue. If you don't already follow um, the Kinship Families Coalition of Kentucky Facebook page, um, if, if, as you're on the Zoom, please go ahead and do that. Um, and also share it if you do already follow so that folks can be privy to those events and just other, we post a lot of resources for families on there. And I know Norma helps to share those out as well. So I would just encourage folks to share those if possible and um, keep your eyes out for some upcoming events. I think we'll see an extra special one happening in September that we uh, will be sharing with this group and, and, and beyond. Um, in the coming weeks. So thank you all so much for your time, Donna. Thank you so much for your expertise. Thank and we you. really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you all.
All right. I've stopped our streaming on Facebook. So thanks. All. Thanks, Mara. Donna, thanks again. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks for all that right, training. Thank you. No problem. All right. Bye guys. See, see ya. ya. Thank you.